In this final look at plant diversity too, we'll conclude by looking at angiosperm diversity. And that's what we'll entitle this last flowchart. In order to really understand angiosperm diversity, I suggest taking a look at figure 30.14b as we go over this flowchart because it labels out some of these uh, clades and grades and phyla of angiosperm and also looking at 30.17 as we look through the diversity of angiosperms. Now, first and foremost, we have to always look at when angiosperms developed, whenever we talk about the diversity of whatever plant, animal, organism in question. And they were first sort of seen in the fossil record uh, to show up at about 140 million years ago. Again, remember, when we give these dates, it's a good habit to take all of the dates given, especially in terms of plants, and label them out on a timeline just to see the scope of the bigger picture, to see when things developed and when they first came. Angiosperms were certainly the latest, certainly the most developed, certainly the most evolved, and thus, of course, certainly eventually the most successful plants. Now, in terms of the diversity, we have to first look at the basal angiosperms, the original angiosperms. I like to think of them as, as the ancestral angiosperms also. The basal angiosperms consist of about 100 of the total species that, that are considered angiosperm in nature. Now, the 100 species, of these 100 species, uh, the one of focus that we'll look at is actually called Amborella and that's going to be a capital A because that's the genus Amborella trichopoda, and that's the species, so lowercase t. What should we know about this specific basal angiosperm? This is actually the entire base of the tree. It serves as the entire root of this tree, and it's essentially going to be a sh very shrub-like plant. So definitely not flowering, definitely not fruit bearing, just a shrub-like simple plant that still has angiosperm characteristics and qualities. Another type of basal angiosperm uh, are water lilies. Water lilies are another example of these basal angiosperms. These are of course going to be aquatic, so they're actually kind of going backwards in their capabilities of land plants. And then also one last one to remember is the star anise. All of these are basal angiosperms, old ancestral angiosperms that started it all. Moving forward, angiosperm diversity also includes a lineage known as the magnolids. So we'll subtitle this the magnolids lineage. I think there's two eyes here, magnolids lineage. So this is another group of angiosperms. This actually contains about 8,000 species somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 species total. And this is going to basically be, for example, things like magnolia. That's a flower that many people are familiar with. The magnolias are going to fall under this lineage, and they are, of course, then angiosperms as well. And it also includes a very popular uh, plant that's necessary for a lot of human endeavors, and that's the black pepper plant. Black pepper plants are also of the magnolids lineage all of which are angios, angiosperms. Finally, last thing about the angiosperms diversity, um, many textbooks, many courses look at angiosperms and sort of divide them into monocots versus eudicots. We didn't really do that in great detail, but just so that you are aware, monocots are going to possess and sort of contain about one-fourth of all angiosperm species. So remember how we had hundreds of thousands of these species, one-fourth of all um, angio species are monocots. And in addition, the eudicots consist of and make up one third of all of them. So one third all angio species are eudicots. And finally, take a look at figure 30.16 to really uh, see what it means to be either or, monocot or eudicot, figure 30.16 gives a good look at the characteristics of both. Those are not, I'm not going to mention explicitly here, the figure does a good job of it. And that covers our angiosperm diversity. Overall, in this lecture, we looked at basically uh, two different types of plants that successfully have colonized land and disperse 
uh, and use seeds as in terms of their reproductive capabilities. The gymnosperms and the angiosperms, both of which are very diverse, both of which are very complex in their life cycles, it's important to understand that this complexity is what's allowed both of them to have their own respective successes on land as the dominant forms of life, let's say, on land. They are capable, they are definitely ever-present, they are seen everywhere, and that's because of their advantageous uh, uh, sort of evolutionary components that we looked at and their overall life cycles that we studied in great detail. Hopefully you've gained a greater appreciation for this type of plant diversity. We're going to now be shifting gears from the plant diversity side and looking more explicitly at some plant anatomy in the next upcoming lectures.